Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Olumide McCollum. Hello and welcome. Tonight, crisis rocking ruling of Progressive's Congress deepens as two groups lay claim to the party's acting national chairmanship position. Countdown to Edo State Governorship election begins as Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, asks participating parties to conduct primaries in the next 10 days. President Mohamed Ibuari gives assurance that security forces are capable of containing bandits terrorizing northern states. National Security Advisor and Police visit states recently attacked. Resident Doctor Strike enters Day 3, with compliance level increasing in some states. And World Health Organization cautions against the use of dexamethasone for COVID-19 treatment. Plus, business and news from Abuja, the FCT, and later from our studios in London. On business news tonight, Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries sees gradual recovering global oil demand later this year in its latest monthly report. On sports news tonight, British government appeals to fans to watch English Premier League matches from home as 2019-2020 season resumes. And from Abuja, President Buhari asks international community to support collaborations aimed at sharing knowledge from research and science to fight coronavirus. And we begin with politics. There appears to be some confusion as to who is the acting national chairman of the All Progressives Congress following the appeal court's ruling affirming the suspension of Mr. Adams Oshomale. Two persons are laying claim to that position with the party's National Working Committee affirming former Oyo State Governor Abiola Ajimobi as the acting national chairman. But due to Mr. Ajimobi's unavoidable absence, the NWC in Abuja today unanimously appointed the national vice chairman for South South Hilliard Etta due to act on his behalf. We have resorted strictly to the constitution of the All Progressives Congress because the constitution is intended to deal with matters such as this, that in the event of the inavailability of an officer of the party, the constitution is invested with the process of replacement. And so, according to the constitution of our party, the NWC reaffirms His Excellency Chief Ajimobi Deputy National Chairman South as the acting chairman, acting national chairman of the party. And in his absence, as also enshrined in our constitution, the national vice chairman of the party from the zone from which the national chairman hails from and in this case, the South-South acts on behalf of His Excellency Chief Ajumobi. The party is running on encumbered. The party, the constitution of the party envisages that from time to time, we will have these kinds of circumstances. And because this is so, the Constitution provides us with remedies. And following the ongoing Edo State primaries of the party, the NWC has constituted an election panel, a seven man election panel, for the Edo primary elections that is scheduled to hold on the 22nd of June, 2020. 
However, the APC Deputy National Secretary, Mr. Victor Giardon, has also declared himself as the acting national chairman of the party. On the strength of a Federal Capital Territory High Court order obtained on March the 16th, Mr. Giardon announced his takeover during a news conference held at the headquarters of the party in Abuja. I bring to your notice that on the 16th of March 2020, Honorable Justice S.U. Baturi, in suit number FCT slash HC slash N6447 2020, had ordered that the suspension of Comrade Ali Oshomle, I, Chief Honorable Victor Yadon, should act as national chairman of our great party. That order could not be immediately effected at that time because of the temporary reprieve Adam Oshomoli got from the Court of Appeal on the same date. However, having removed the temporary reprieve yesterday by the Court of Appeal, and considering the fact that we cannot allow for a vacuum, I most humbly inform you that I have assumed office as the national chairman of our great party in compliance with the order of the court. As your acting national chairman and presiding officer in the National Working Committee, we therefore cancel the decision of the screening and appeal committee of the former chairman of the party on the Edo primaries. Meanwhile, another legal document has surfaced, this time from a group in the Southwest claiming that the position of the deputy national chairman south of the APC is still vacant and that the party's acting national chairman, Abiola Jimobi, is not eligible to occupy the seat. The group's lawyer, Babatundioke, said in a statement that the suit was instituted at the Federal High Court in Aduikiti on February the 12th, 2020, against the APC National Working Committee and Ajimobi asking the court, amongst other things, to fill up the position in line with the party's constitution. The statement explains that at the time it was instituted, Senator Ajimobi's name had not been purportedly recognized, but he was later announced as the deputy national chairman south of the party. It adds that Senator Ajimobi's lawyer had also denied his appointment in court on March the 23rd as the court warned that all parties desist from changing the status quo on the suit. The group insists that Senator Ajimobi is not recognized as the substantive deputy national chairman south of the APC and can therefore not act as the party's national chairman. They're asking the National Working Committee of the APC to take note of the suit and desist from committing contempt of court. And to the Edo governorship poll, as the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has asked the 15 political parties participating in the September 19th exercise to conduct their primaries within the next 10 days. INEC Chairman Professor Mahmoud Yakubu gave the directive today in Abuja during the second virtual meeting of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security. He warned that the commission will not extend the timetable for any party that misses out on the deadline. According to Mr. Yakubu, the deadline is Saturday, 27th June 2020. I must stress that the date is firm and fixed. There will be no extension of the deadline. While the conduct of primaries and nomination of candidates will be the sole responsibility of political parties, our officials will monitor the primaries as required by law. And to the court of law, former Attorney General of the Federation, Mohamed Adoke, and his co-accused, Ali Wabubaka, have pleaded not guilty to charges of corruption following their fresh arraignment. Both men are facing a seven-count charge bordering on money laundering, bribery, and abuse of office. They had earlier been arraigned before Justice Binta Yako of the Federal High Court, but after recusing herself from the trial and returning the file to the chief judge, the matter was reassigned to another judge, Justice Inyang Ekwo, has adjourned the case to August the 3rd, 4th, 5th, 6th, and 7th for resumption of trial. There are two components of the charges. The first component has to do with the underlying criminal offenses. The second component has to do with the money laundering offenses. The proceedings of today had to do with the arraignment in charge of the money laundering offenses arising from the sale and uh, fraudulent disposition of the proceeds of the Malabu oil and gas block 245. This matter was transferred from court 2 to court 5 and it's normal in cases of this nature that when a matter is transferred to another court it starts afresh de novo so there's nothing unusual in that. 
To security, the president is assuring Nigerians that the nation's armed forces are fully capable of dealing with the challenges of banditry and terrorism. President Mohamed Buhari's assurances are conveyed in a statement from his special assistant on media and publicity, publicity Garba Shehu, in which he calls for more patience as the military takes steps to block gaps being exploited to unleash mayhem on innocent citizens. According to the president, Nigeria's military has displayed its capabilities in the past and will show it again by dealing with the current challenges. He also appeals to the people of Katsina State to be patient and supportive of the ongoing military operations in the state, while sympathizing with those who are bereaved, injured, and have lost property. Meanwhile, the nation's national security advisor, Babagana Mungunu, has described the situation in Katsina State as highly disturbing. He made the observation when he visited the state today, along with the Inspector General of Police and the Director General of the Department of State Service. The security chiefs also visited Sokoto State, where they assured residents that the president is concerned about the rising tide of insecurity and is committed to stamping out the attacks. Mr. President is alarmed at the rate of insecurity in the country, but particularly what is happening in the Northwest, which is unprecedented. He has asked me to convey to you his determination to rid your state of these elements and to restore normalcy so that there is social stability, economic stability, and progress, not only for the good people of Sokoto State, but for the entire northwestern zone of which Sokoto is a pilot. Your Excellency, we do understand the concerns of the wider society of the people of Sokoto State. This is very, very understandable, and we know that there's a lot of expectation on the security agencies, not just the intelligence, but the armed forces and the police. We are here to discuss with you one-on-one -on -one, in a spirit of frankness and to find out where gaps are so that we can collectively address these issues. We here in Sokoto are ready and fully prepared to continue to give our 100% support for this mission to succeed of restoring normalcy, restoring peace and order in Sokoto State. Let me therefore thank you and the rest of the service chiefs for all of their efforts so far and through you to thank all of your men and officers that are here in Sokoto under the leadership of your various security uh, heads here in the state that have been doing their very best. And I can assure you that there is synergy here in Sokoto amongst all of the services. They work together and we work together with them. And the common objective is to Secure the state, in particular the areas where we're having all of these challenges. Meanwhile, human rights group Amnesty International has criticized the federal government over the arrest of the organizer of the Katsina protests against banditry, Nastura Sharif. This is calling for the immediate release of Mr. Sharif, who is also the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Coalition of Northern Groups. During the protest, the youth led by Mr. Sharif had called for the resignation of Governor Aminu Masari, who had admitted that his government had been overwhelmed by the security situation. In a statement on Wednesday, the Director of Operations for the protest group, Aminu Adam, said the police arrested Sharif after inviting the leaders of the group for an interactive session. The presidency had on Tuesday called on the youth to stop protesting, adding that it was affecting the morale of the security agents. In part two, after the break, 
Resident doctor strike enters day three with compliance level increasing in some states. Please join us again. Welcome back. If you've just joined us, you're watching the news at 10, live on Channels Television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Crisis rocking ruling all progressives Congress deepens as two groups lay claim to party's national chairmanship position. Countdown to Edo State Governorship election begins as Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, asks participating parties to conduct primaries in the next 10 days. President Mohamed Buhari approves joint military and police operation against bandits terrorizing northern states. National Security Advisor and Police IGP visit states recently attacked. Resident doctor strike enters day three with compliance level increasing in some states. And World Health Organization cautions against use of dexamethasone for COVID-19 treatment. Our website, ChannelsTV.com, has more information on our top stories and others. Subscribe and watch Channels Television's live stream on YouTube and other social media platforms using your mobile device browser or download the Channels TV app for Android and iOS devices from their respective stores. You can also watch us via your smart TV platforms on Apple TV, Android TV, Fire TV and Roku. In the northwestern region of the country, the Kaduna State House of Assembly Committee on Ethics and Privileges is investigating the invasion of the house plenary and attempted theft of the legislative mace on June the 11th. The committee has summoned seven members to appear before it for their alleged involvement in the crisis that engulfed the house. Those being investigated include the former speaker, Aminu Shagali, and the impeached deputy speaker, Mukhtar Hazo. The, the invitation follows a motion of urgent public importance sponsored by the member representing Zaria constituency, Suleiman Dabo. It's another day in the life of the Kaduna State House of Assembly, and the atmosphere around the vicinity rather seems to tell the story of an uneasy calm, with the presence of security operatives who are there to prevent any breakdown of law and order. The State House of Assembly Committee on Ethics and Privileges has summoned seven members to appear before it for their alleged involvement in the recent crisis that rocked the House. As we are all aware, the business of the House was obstructed. And there was an attempt also to steal the legislative maze by the, by the above members, led by Honorable Yusuf Liman Dahiru during the business of the House on 11 June. Third, refusal to conform to the standing orders of the House and willful disregard of the authority of the House. Chairman House well, Committee on Information bears his mind that, over the incident. That means it was like a coup. And then you know what it entails. If a soldier goes for a coup, <laughs> you know exactly what will surely happen. And then they have been told to appear before the Ethics and Privileges Committee to answer, to explain to the House and to the general public what they did because we want everybody to know that it wasn't just a normal thing for a member to do just that. The lawmaker who raised the motion on disorderly conduct as a matter of urgent public importance explains the reason for taking the step. So it would be unfair if we keep quiet with such kind of things because we are seen as, you know, we are portraying a very bad political culture and, and socialization. So I think it's important. That was why I said, let me raise this motion for, for, to serve as, uh, as, 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 as a kind of, maybe it, may, it might eventually be a deterrent to, 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 to future occurrence. On June the 11th, the Kaduna State House of Assembly witnessed a rowdy session with the invasion of its plenary and attempted theft of the legislative mace. A move which turned into a scuffle among some lawmakers. 
the Ethics and Privileges Committee is expected to report its findings in one week when sanctions will be meted on airing lawmakers. The question is, will the former Speaker Aminu Shagali and the impeached Deputy Speaker Mukhtar Hazo be indicted after the investigations? We turn our attention to our coverage of the COVID-19 pandemic. President Muhammadu Buhari is asking the international community to support collaborations and initiatives aimed at sharing knowledge from research and science to fight the pandemic. The president spoke on Wednesday in Abuja at a virtual extraordinary China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19, co-hosted by the Forum for China-Africa Cooperation, FOCAC. He also told the summit that Nigeria will support any joint and collective action plan at regional and global levels to tackle the pandemic and its fallout. The summit was co-hosted by the Chinese president, the South African president, and AAU chairperson, Cyril Ramaphosa, and Senegal president and co-chair of FOCAC, Maki Saw. As we face a common pervasive and invisible enemy, it is important that we all remain united to save our shared humanity because this virus knows no borders. The fight against a global pandemic that continues to take so many lives, threaten livelihoods, and challenging the very fabric of societies requires enhanced cooperation and worldwide solidarity. Excellencies, I see this opportunity to reiterate the need to this summit to put humanity at the center of our vision for common prosperity. We must learn lessons and share knowledge from research as we develop more creative, responsive, and humane health systems, improve crisis management protocols, and support each other in the battle against COVID-19. Nigeria supports and will join any joint and collaborative action plan of regional and global levels to tackle this pandemic and its fallout. In these, in these endeavors, we must not fail because the lives and livelihood of our peoples depend on our collective efforts. The Jigawa state government also says it will close down the 240-bed capacity isolation center in Fanisau following the successes recorded in the fight against COVID-19 in the state. The Commissioner of Health, Dr. Aba Zakari, who confirmed this to newsmen in Dutse, the state capital, says the state has only eight active cases out of the 317 recorded, as 257 have recorded and have been discharged, while nine have died. According to the commissioner, it will be a waste of resources to continue operating the isolation center. And now to our Abuja studios for more stories. Here's Linda Akigwe. Hello, Linda. Hello, Lumide. Now, staying with the health sector, following the deadlock in yesterday's meeting between the federal government and the National Association of Resident Doctors, the Nigerian Medical Association is calling for a middle ground in their negotiations. NMA President Professor Innocent Uja says parties must come to an agreement to avoid a collapse of the health sector, especially in the face of the rising cases of COVID-19. Professor Uja made the call in Makodi, the Benue State capital, during a visit to the Benue State chapter of the association. Scanty premises, devoid of the usual influx of patients seeking medical attention. That's the impact caused by the resident doctor strike as the absence of doctors begins to take its toll at the Lagos State University Teaching Hospital, Lasuf. Although cameras are not allowed in clinical areas, the outlook at various entrances indicates that services are significantly reduced. With middle-level manpower away from work, the hospital management depends on principal medical officers and consultants to keep the institution running. What the hospital management has done is to ensure that the consultants as well as the house officers 
remain in their duty posts to limit the collateral damage that could have happened you know, with this withdrawal of service. The non-implementation of the Medical Residency Act, non-payment of hazard allowances and salaries, as well as shortage of PPEs are some of the reasons for the industrial action. If I had been in a position to advise them, I would definitely have told them that the timing was wrong, no matter what it is that they are uh, agitating for. In neighboring Ekiti State, resident doctors are also observing the strike, leaving the State University Teaching Hospital with those exempted from the action. If we sincerely have very uh, bad patients, we don't have what it takes to take care of them. So that's why we are uh, clamoring for upgrading of the healthcare system so that we can even take good care of them. In North Central Nigeria, resident doctors at the Joss University Teaching Hospital are fully in compliance with the industrial action. A team goes around the wards to monitor those on duty while enforcing compliance to the directive. An attendance register is used to capture those at work. We've complied with the director of the minister. The registers have been open, but we are yet to get the reports from various sets of departments. To uh, wake up to the news that um, strong arm tactics are being deployed on the doctors, I think is truly unfortunate. And I advise the Ministry of Health to retrace his steps. In the absence of resident doctors, Nurses and other health workers are assisting medical consultants at the Federal Neuropsychiatric Hospital in Kaduna State in northwest Nigeria. We did not discharge anybody that is not fit to be discharged. We tried to maintain services. The meeting between the federal government and resident doctors is deadlocked for now, leaving room for more concerns about the effect of the action on the health sector. Concerns that can only be addressed when both parties are in agreement. We'll bring you more stories from Abuja when the news at 10 returns. Plus, OPEC sees gradual recovery in global oil demand later this year in its latest monthly report. That's on business news. Please stay with us. And you're welcome back to the news at 10, coming to you live from Abuja. So the House of Representatives, 196.6 billion naira has been spent in the last five years to feed over 9 million pupils under the federal government's school feeding program. That's what the special advisor to the president on school feeding program, Dotun Adebayo, revealed when he appeared before the House of Representatives Committee on Public Accounts. When lawmakers requested for the details of the cooks engaged, he explains that states engage the schools and cooks while the federal government makes the payments. 196.6 billion. Okay. Over so, the period of five years. So do you have records of beneficiaries? Yes. And do you, how many people tell us? Yes. 9 million, 41,393 pupils. The states engage the cooks, and the cooks are selected from communities. Uh, the criteria of a cook to be on the program is that they must live within the vicinity of the school. That's the first uh, criteria. The second criteria is they go through a health screening. Every child, we, uh, is uh, 17 naira is budgeted per child on the school feeding program. So for every cook that is assigned a number of children, they are paid 70 naira per child for the period of 20 days. Now. When we pay to the states, we don't pay to state coordinators. We pay straight to the accounts of the cooks. The only other payments we make are to suppliers. Suppliers who are approved by the state government for protein items. The federal government plans to concession 10 major highways in the country. This was announced today by the Minister of Works, Batunde Fashola, during a meeting with the Joint National Assembly Committee on Works. Mr. Fashola explains that the project is anchored on the private sector engagement and investors are expected to carry out the development and management of the road networks. 
We are looking at 10 routes, two phases first, for the value added concession uh, across Nigeria's highway. And those two phases will cover 10 routes. And as best as possible, we have tried to ensure that there is a uh, geographic spread in those 10 routes as pilot. We will not be perfect here, but we have tried as much as possible to ensure that no zone is left out. So if you look at it, you will see that the northeast is there, you will see that the north central is there, you will see that the southeast is there, the south south is captured. Uh, nobody, no zone is left out. The estimated investment that we expect is in the order of 163.323 billion. That's the investment that we hope we can attract. It speaks to the possibility of 23,322 jobs in phase one and the possibility of doubling that in, in, in phase two. And this includes not only employment during construction, but also employment post-construction, post-development, and through continuous maintenance. Away from the National Assembly, cement giant Dangote Cement PLC is paying 16 Naira for every share held to its shareholders for the year ended December 2019. The chairman of the company, Alaji Aliku Dangote, said this today at the 11th annual general meeting of the company in Lagos. He also said while the operations of the company has been challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic, it has performed strongly under the prevailing environment. Chairman. Strictly observing the NCDC guidelines for COVID-19, the management of Dangote Cement PLC gathered for the 11th annual general meeting in this hall. Issues deliberated here range from sheer buybacks, low operations at its Boko factory, to independent power to lessen the costs of operations, as well as the need to champion the cement revolution and cover the housing deficits in Nigeria. Cement will continue to be used for these things. And for you, who they listen to, I hope you will make the government to also realize that this is the right time for them to close the gap in deficit of housing in this country. We will be capturing the votes of the shareholders physically present at this meeting to arrive at the final voting results. The meeting then moves into the seventh sustainability agenda, chiefly bordering on the election of the new directors of Dangote Cement PLC, which is coordinated by the company's secretary. The end of the voting is closely followed by an acceptance by the new leadership. We to do our best in positively repositioning Dangote Cement PLC as an industry leader in all frontiers under the leadership of the chairman. Then comes the high point of the day with the announcement of 16 Naira per share dividends to shareholders for the year ended December 2019. The board of directors has recommended that a dividend of 16 Naira per share subject to the withholding tax be declared in respect of the year ended December 31st, 2019. The future, according to the management, is promising despite the challenge of COVID-19. Is it also by uh, reducing costs, for example, costs related to energy, as it was said during the AGM, this is the plan and the way forward. Our duty is to make sure that we really, really strive to make sure we keep satisfying the shareholders. And I think we have done our best. You know, if you look at over the years, we've actually grown. The company has reported a strong performance despite a tough operating environment, with revenue down 1.1% to 891.7 billion naira in 2019 from 901.2 billion in 2018. The company currently boasts of 45.6 million metric tons in 10 countries, including 23.7 million metric tons consistent clinker in its exports.
The U.S. Treasury's Office of Foreign Assets Control in the State Department says it has taken action against six Nigerian nationals for conducting an elaborate scheme to steal over $6 million from victims across the United States. The action is described as a coordinated action with the U.S. Department of Justice. According to a statement from the U.S. Treasury Department, the individuals targeted U.S. businesses and individuals through deceptive global threats known as business email compromise and romance fraud. The statement names individuals as Richard Uzu, Michael Olorunyomi, Alex Ogunshaki, Felix Okpo, Namdi Benson and Abiola Kayode. It says the Nigerians impersonated business executives and requested and received wire transfers from legitimate business accounts. Money was also stolen from the innocent Americans by romance fraud in which the designees masqueraded as affectionate partners to gain trust from the victims. Meanwhile, the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, has arraigned a man before a federal high court sitting in Oshobo, the Oshun state's capital, for impersonating a woman to defraud white females. According to EFCC prosecutor, the suspect, Timilei Awojobi, posed as a white American woman from New York on a medical mission to Nigeria and defrauded his victim of the sum of $4,380 and 512 naira as part payment of his flight back to the U.S. The defendant initially pleaded not guilty to the 15 counts of fraud preferred against him, but later opted for a plea bargain. Justice Peter Lifu granted him bail in the sum of 20 million naira with two shorties. He then adjourned the matter till June 30th, 2020 for the adoption of a plea bargain agreement on hearing. And that's all from Abuja. Now to Anne Wawodu for Business News. Thanks a lot, Linda. Welcome to Business News. Global demand for oil is expected to see a gradual recovery later this year. And that's according to latest forecasts by the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. In its latest monthly report released today, OPEC expects demand to decline by 6.4 million barrels per day in the second half of this year, which is less than the 11.9 million barrels day drop in the first six months of the year. However, OPEC cautions that downside risks remain for consumption in top consumer, that's the United States, despite reduction of the global crude oil surplus following the deep cuts in output by its members. Meanwhile, the Technical Committee of OPEC and its allies and an OPEC Plus ministerial panel are meeting on Thursday to review the supply cuts impact on the market. The Federation Accounts Allocation Committee has shared the th three tiers of government, a total sum of 547.3 billion naira as a Federation allocation for the month of May. A breakdown of that amount, as attributed by the FAC, shows the federal government received 219.7 billion naira, 152.4 billion naira was allocated to the states, while the local government councils received 114.09 billion naira. While the oil producing states got 37.02 billion naira as 13% derivation fund of mineral revenue. The statement also explains that petroleum profit tax, import duty, and value added tax recorded increases, while companies' income tax, oil royalty, and excise duties recorded a decrease. China says it will cancel the debt of some relevant African countries in the form of interest-free government loans, which will be due at the end of this year. China's President Xi Jinping, who made this known today in a speech at the Extraordinary China-Africa Summit on Solidarity Against COVID-19, says the world's second largest economy will extend the period of debt suspension for African countries hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic and under heavy financial stress to help them overcome the current difficulty. He also adds that his country is willing to explore broader cooperation with Africa in such new business forms as digital economy, smart city, clean energy and 5G to boost Africa's development and revitalization. 
The African Development Bank has announced its inclusion on the Nasdaq Sustainable Bond Network, which of course will attract the attention of finances of climate and green growth funds to bank social bond. And this is coming as the AFDB seeks to alleviate the impact of the coronavirus on African economies. The NBSN, which was launched in December last year, is a platform with 4,000 bonds and 40 issuers in 13 countries. It's designed to promote transparency in the market for social and green bonds. The AFDB established the social bond framework back in 2017. It has now raised $5.5 billion, supporting 89 projects in 28 African countries. After maintaining a firm grip in four consecutive sessions, the bears lost their hold today at the equities market at the close of business. Interest renewed for consumer goods equities lifted the NS's main index. Temple Ashaju has the details for us. Thank you for joining us on the Stock Market Report. The equities market defied the negative report of a 12.40% rise in headline inflation for the month of May today to buck the four consecutive days of losses as investors returned to pick up high-value stocks with low valuations across a few counters in the market. Nestle was the toast of investors after finding a support level of around 1,000 Naira without being hit by the wave of profits taken in the past few trading sessions. The stock saw a 10% rise in value, which in turn impacted on the consumer goods sector and of course subsequently rubbed off on the overall picture of the stock market, which closed up 0.17% after investors gained some 22 billion Naira. Traders, however, stayed risk off on some of the large to mid cap stocks like Seplat, GT Bank, Name It, and of course, NPF Microfinance Bank that were all available for some sort of profit taking as they look forward to more profitable trading sessions for the rest of the week. And that's your stock market report. I'm Temple Ashaju. And that's it in this midweek edition of Business News. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Anne Umawadu. It's back to you, Lumide. Thank you, Anne. Still ahead on the news at 10. World Health Organization cautions against the use of dexamethasone for COVID-19 treatment. Plus, more stories from our London studios with Around the World in 5. Please stay with us. Welcome back. The Edo State Governor, Godwin Obasiki, has been meeting behind closed doors with some governors elected on the platform of the People's Democratic Party, the PDP. Channels Television reliably gathered that Governor Obasiki is meeting with the National Chairman of PDP, Prince Uche Secundus, the Governors of Sokoto State and PDP Governors Forum, Chairman Aminu Tambuwal, Governor Yesan Wike of River State, as well as the party's National, national Secretary. Now, details of his meeting with the PDP leaders are still under wraps, but it may be not unconnected with Governor Basaki's moves to join the opposition party towards seeking the governorship ticket for the forthcoming polls in Edo State. The World Health Organization has cautioned on the use of dexamethasone, the cheap and widely available drug that can help save patients seriously ill with COVID-19. Head of the WHO's emergency program, Mr. That is Dr. Mike Ryan, says it's important to reserve use of the drug for the treatment only of serious cases of COVID-19 for which it has been shown to have a benefit. Here's Simon Pusey with more international news in Around the World in 5. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London for your international news around the world in 5. China has closed schools in Beijing after restricting air travel from the capital to prevent a second wave of coronavirus infections. Beijing reported another 31 cases on Wednesday, bringing the total to 137 in the past week. Before the recent spike, the city had gone 57 days without a locally transmitted case. At least 27 neighbourhoods have been classed as medium or high-risk areas, and no one neighbourhood near the market where the outbreak supposedly started has been labelled as high-risk. 
While the fears in China are about a second wave of infections after largely bringing its outbreak under control, countries in Latin America are still struggling to cope with the first wave. Brazil, the country with the second highest number of infections after the U.S., has reported its highest daily jump in cases, while Peru's death toll has surged past 7,000. It should never have happened. Meanwhile, New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern has said the two new coronavirus cases in New Zealand are an unacceptable failure to the system and the Defence Force will now oversee the country's quarantine facilities and strengthen border requirements. China has said it wants to avoid further clashes with India along the Himalayan border after the first deadly confrontation between the two nuclear powers in decades killed at least 20 Indian soldiers. The Chinese foreign ministry reiterated that China is not to be blamed for Monday's clash and said the overall situation at the border is still stable and controllable. According to Indian officials, no shots were fired, but soldiers were hit with clubs and stones during a confrontation that erupted between the two sides along the border. Meanwhile, the South Korean unification minister has offered his resignation over the sharp rise in tensions with the North. The announcement comes a day after North Korea blew up a symbolic liaison office near the border, which was built to improve ties with the South. The North Korean army has also said it will send troops into disarmed areas along the border, Kim Yol-chul said he took responsibility for the worsening of inter-Korean relations. Lebanon's Hezbollah leader Syed Hassan Nasrallah has said big investment is needed to bring up the country's currency and accused the United States of preventing money from reaching the country. A drop in Lebanon's currency last week sparked fresh protests in Lebanon, prompting the government to announce that the central bank would begin injecting dollars into the market this week to reverse its fall. In a televised address, Nasrallah said the United States has blocked dollars from reaching Lebanon and has worsened the situation. Meanwhile, Syria has devalued its currency that hit a record low after the U.S. announced it will implement new sanctions aimed at cutting off revenue for President Bashar al-Assad's government. The U.S. hopes the sanctions will push Assad back into United Nations-led negotiations and settle an end to the country's nearly decade-long war. Russia and China have criticized the U.S. plan to impose further unilateral sanctions and said the purpose of these measures was to overthrow the legitimate authorities in Syria. Residents of the Brazilian city of Sao Paulo have taken to the streets to protest about the death of a 15-year-old boy who was allegedly killed by police. <laughs> Gilhem Silva Guides went missing on Sunday. His body was later found with two gunshot wounds to the head and signs of aggression on his body. Sao Paulo's civil police have confirmed two officers from the military police are being treated as suspects. Protesters have set fire to vehicles in anger over the death. In Uganda, the presidential hopeful pop star and lawmaker Robert Kyagulanyi, most commonly known as Bobby Wine, has announced an alliance with the veteran opposition leader Kiza Besigye. The substance of the agreement remains unclear, including whether the two opposition parties will field joint candidates. Uganda will hold a presidential election between the 10th of January and the 8th of February in 2021 and will introduce restrictions aimed at slowing the spread of COVID-19. Facebook boss Mark Zuckerberg has said users will be able to turn off political adverts on the social network in the run-up to the 2020 U.S. elections. Facebook has faced heavy criticism for allowing adverts from politicians that contain false information. The company has said it plans to make the new feature available to all U.S. users over the next few weeks and will offer it in other countries this autumn. And finally, television series, movies and documentaries about the experience of black people in the United States have seen a huge surge in viewership amid anti-racism demonstrations since the death of George Floyd. Ava DuVernay's documentary 13th about mass incarceration that disproportionately affects black people in the U.S. has seen its audience surge by 4,665% over the past three weeks. That's according to data by the streaming service Netflix. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Let's have another sports news. French side Lille has resumed training for the 2020-2021 league season without Super Eagles forward Victor Osime. Osime is currently in Nigeria after the death of his father last month. Lille coach Christophe Gaultier confirmed on the club's website that permission has been granted to the Nigerian to sort his personal issues out. 
Arsenal's David Luiz has been sent off in a performance riddled with mistakes as Manchester City FC secured a comfortable 3-0 victory behind closed doors on the first night of the English Premier League's return. Sheffield United were denied by a bizarre goal-line technology error in their draw at Aston Villa. Players, staff and officials took a knee just after kick-off to show support for the Black Lives Matter movement. Britain's sports minister Oliver Dowden says fans should watch the Premier League games from home as the 2019-2020 season resumes today after over three months owing to the COVID-19 pandemic. Dowden added that medical experts are working in the coming weeks to develop a roadmap for safely returning to watching the games at the stadiums. I'm Ayotunde Balogun. That's a wrap on Sports News. It's back to you, Lumide. Thank you, Ayo. And the main news again, the crisis rocking the ruling of Progressive Congress APC today deepened as two groups laid claim to the party's national chairmanship position. The deputy national secretary of the party, Victor Gyadom, was the first to declare himself acting national chairman of the party. Shortly after that, the National Working Committee also met at the party secretariat where the affirmed former Ayo state governor, Abiola Jimobi, as the party's acting national chairman. But a legal document that later surfaced today says Senator Ajimobi is not eligible to hold the position. That's the news at 10 tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ulumide Makoli. Do have a good night.